Well, I'd like to welcome you all to another Institute Encounter, uh, our series of interviews with uh, visiting speakers uh, to Texas Tech um, who have something important to say. Uh, our speaker today and our guest in this interview is Dr. John Fonte. Uh, Dr. Fonte is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, uh, an expert on uh, international law, international organization, and transnationalism. Um, most recently, uh, the author of Sovereignty or Submission, uh, a book that won the Intercollegiate Studies Institute Prize for best book uh, and which uh, for a time was the number one bestseller uh, on the Amazon website in the category of international law. Uh, it's a book that has had uh, many whose arguments uh, have been reverberating uh, through the international law community. It's a book that takes on uh, one of the, one might say, great projects uh, of the post-Second World War world, uh, the creation of transnational and global structures of governance. Um, uh, that project has a lot of supporters. Uh, Dr. Fonte uh, is one of its uh, ablest and most cogent critics. So let me turn to Dr. Fonte and ask him, what got you interested uh, in transnationalism? <coughs> Well, I think uh, the interest probably started um, about the time of the, uh, the uh, Francis Fukuyama wrote his article first and later became a book, but an article called The End of History uh, in which he said uh, that essentially liberal de democracy had triumphed ideologically. Uh, the Berlin Wall fell down uh, and uh, liberalism broadly understood to mean liberal democracy. Uh, had defeated all of its rivals. Aristocracy had been defeated at the end of the First World War with the disappearance of the monarchies uh, and the great ri ideological rivals of the 20th century, fascism, national socialism, and of course communism. And he said that there would be future challenge, no, there would be no serious future challenge to liberal democracy. There would be radical Islam, there may be some authoritarian regimes in Asia and elsewhere, but these regimes would not have universal appeal in the sense of students in, in, in at Berkeley or, or, or Berlin or Beijing uh, subscribing to radical Islam or to uh, <coughs> Asian authoritarianism or something. So that was his point, that it, the ideological questions had been settled. Uh, from where I was standing, <coughs> it looked like it hadn't been settled. It looked like liberalism, as far from being triumphant, was actually being challenged on a number of fronts. It was being challenged below, which was the 90s, and this was the period of, strong period of an emphasis on multiculturalism um, and this, this appeared to be a, a challenge to, um, uh, to liberalism in the sense that liberalism emphasizes the individual, multicultural emphasizes the, the ascribed group that one is born into. So this was a challenge from below and many scholars were writing about this. And then from above there was a talk about globalism and of course in the 90s uh, um, the globalist uh, <coughs> movement, globalist ideology really took off uh, and the UN said, uh, leadership of the UN said, in fact had a couple of books out, printed by the UN saying global governance, now that the Cold War is over, uh, we can promote global governance. Uh, so it seemed that this was a challenge, the question of I mean, the global governance, transnationalism, combined with this internal uh, multicultural, represented a, a sort of a regime challenge. Uh, by regime, I mean way of life, I mean in the Aristotelian sense that uh, not just the political system but sort of the broad way of life I and mean, that's what Fukuyama was saying that the liberal way of life including the economic policy had triumphed I thought the liberal way of life was being challenged above <clears throat> by what was global and below by uh, multicultural and there's uh, as we know various uh, countries have broken up and, mm -hmm. and uh, throughout the world there is this ethnic and and also sort of multicultural challenge so that's how I got interested. I thought, well, Fukuyama's wrong, and uh, why is he wrong? There are other, these other challenges. The challenges from within the West, in a sense. It wasn't from Asian, I mean, there, there are these challenges from Asian authoritarianism and, and radical Islam, but I think he's probably right that they don't have universal appeal. But globalism has universal appeal. If we want, let's just call it globalism for short, transnationalism, um, even multiculturalism sort of and combined with that 
The, this ideology, um, which is sort of a post-liberal ideology, if you want to call it that, if we want to think of monarchy as sort of pre-liberal. Well, it's, it's different yeah. from, from international institutions. Yeah. You're making a distinction between globalization and traditional international relations, negotiations, right. treaties, even traditional international organizations. And, and what is the distinction? Yeah, exactly. I'm going to go into that in some detail in my, my talk tonight. But uh, yes, there's a big difference between international and global. International literally means international, between nations. So the United States and the Soviet Union had an arms control treaty. Uh, <clears throat> you do this, we'll do that. If, if you break the treaty, we'll, uh, we can break it. Uh, this has gone on from time immemorial. Uh, the Founding Fathers had treaties. There was also, uh, there was even some universal uh, goals. Uh, there was something called the Law of Nations, uh, which everybody more or less respected. It means you didn't kill uh, the other country's ambassadors, you accepted a white flag. There were a few universals, so that was the Law of Nations. Carried out by nations international, but, interna but uh, the post-World War II was an international world. The United Nations, it's called United Nations. They were nations, and it was supposed to be run by the nation states. Now, it's, it's uh, global means beyond the nation state. There's a couple other terms um, that we could use. There's international, I just explained, and there's transnational, and that's across, and I'll, um, or within, it's sort of, you think of the transcontinental railway. It goes across, it reaches over, it penetrates. Uh, and then there's supranational, which of course means above. There's certain courts today like the International Criminal Court, which is a supranational court above the nation. So global sort of encompasses both the supranational and the transnational, and it implies looking at something different. Uh, uh, most Fortune 500 companies used to call themselves multi, uh, multinational company, which was sort of international. They're based in the United States, American company, but they've got uh, places abroad, they've got offices abroad, or sort of people know they're an American company. Now, no company says they're multinational. They're, we're a global company. We're not, even though we're headquarters is everywhere, it depends where they might have a headquarters, but they're all sort of equal. And we look at things from a global perspective, not from a perspective. So the, I, the, the sort of distinction is that there's now a sphere of politics beyond that of the nation state, in which the nation state is not the only primary actor, maybe not even the principal actors. There are other actors that are non-nation state actors involved in making decisions. Yes, and I think that's an empirical fact, so I, I don't say this is something we ignore. Right. In fact, the point of the book is to address that, and yes, this is transnational politics exists, so that's, that's Whereas empirical. Whereas in the national setting, it would be nation states sort of collectively addressing problems. Here it's a much larger universe of entities some of which are nation states, but others are organizations and international bodies and the whole corporations, the whole panoply. Exactly, and non-governmental organizations. That's exactly right. And they now, there's now transnational politics. And I, in a couple chapters in the book, I go into detail. Uh, uh, there's a chapter on Israel where they, uh, they clearly face a transnational coalition opposed to their, and that, that, that uh, that includes nation states, or the, the rejectionist bloc in, in the Arab Islamic world would like to see them off the map. There are uh, nations in, in Europe who are uh, supporting uh, non-governmental organizations, NGOs are very hostile to Israel and sort of undermining its legitimacy. Uh, there are many in, you know, transnational NGOs, um, like Human Rights Watch, let's say Amnesty International, that are also uh, carried on sort of a, a, a public relations campaign. Uh, now, am I so right? this is uh, this is so. It's in other words, it's a it's a, it's a coalition, a global government. That's a transnational coalition. So there is such a thing as transnational policy. Am I am I right in thinking that this uh, phenomenon, this development, yeah. of a kind of transnational political process uh, mm -hmm. on on a worldwide scale, uh, is maybe unlike multiculturalism and, and some of the movements, the ideological movements of the past. It doesn't strike me as a kind of mass phenomenon, especially. Um, it, 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 you know, it doesn't involve people marching in the streets particularly. Uh, it doesn't, I would, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, I don't think it grips the imagination in some deep way of, of, of lots and lots of people. Uh, it strikes me as something that's sort of going on among certain relatively confined but influential circles, a uh, kind of elite phenomena. Would that, that be correct? Uh, yes, but I, I think it has a broad social base. Um, <clears throat> the social base, and I'm going to get into this a little bit tonight, but it, 
broad acquaintance. It certainly includes the entire leadership of the United Nations, the leadership of most international organizations. There is a broad international, transnational bureaucracy that works at the International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, World Health Organization, uh, the United Nations, uh, that work for Greenpeace or Amnesty International, that work for global corporations. So we're talking about quite a few number, a large number of people, influential people, people who attend the World Economic Forum in Davos. Um, as I'm going to point out, this is not a conspiracy, or uh, it's not a question of black helicopters arriving, or some kind of Bilderberger, or uh, <coughs> trilateral uh, conspiracy. It's, it's a, a project to promote uh, um, uh, global institutions that uh, will, uh, in their view, uh, <coughs> promote uh, <coughs> well world prosperity and then try to uh, uh, stop uh, violence and, and promote equality and so on. So there's, there's a certain number of goals and <coughs> normative goals attached to this, but uh, and this is pretty, I mean this is, um, you know, the European Union has a wide, a lot, very large bureaucracy in Brussels and uh, I'd say 99% of, of the people, the officials working there would subscribe to this uh, Essentially, globalist philosophy and so the ideology. union itself could be thought of as an international. The, the union is right. Is is, is a pre is mm -hmm. a it's sort of the global governance in miniature. Mm -hmm. It's how post -na it's a perfect example of how a uh, post national regime would work, and it mm -hmm. is sort of working. Um, Fifty, sixty, over sixty percent of, of laws are initiated by the bureaucracy in Brussels, not by the national parliaments. The national parliaments still exist, but they're. Um, uh, they're down a level. They don't have uh, total sovereignty. Um, so this is this is an example of, of how it works. There's a judicial supremacy by the European Court of Justice. That's the EU court. Uh, they also follow another court, the European Court of Human Rights, because uh, members of the EU, European Union, are also members of the Council of Europe, mm -hmm. and they have and they signed a human rights treaty, the European Human Rights Treaty. So this this. Uh, has a direct, I'll give you one example of how this is, has a direct uh, effect on nations. Uh, Britain um, was attempting to uh, <coughs> deport a, a, a terrorist, a convicted terrorist, Jordanian, and um, the case was brought before the European <coughs> uh, Council of Human Rights, European Court of Human Rights, ECHR, in Strasbourg, which is this Council of Europe, and it governs the treaty of the European Human Rights Treaty, and they said no. You can't, you can't deport because he might be tortured, or we, we don't know. Britain said he wasn't, the Jordanians had given um, assurances, and so on. Uh, but anyway, this is British national security that is determined not by the House of Commons. And the result was he wasn't deported? He was not deported. Mm -hmm. uh, he's so, still at large in Britain? Or no, he's, he's under some type uh -huh. of, uh, I don't remember exactly what mm -hmm. it is, but he was not deported. Uh -huh. um, and, and there's others who are on, uh, getting receiving welfare. Anyway, the. Uh, the the nation the um, nation doesn't have complete sovereignty. You know, it was Abraham Lincoln who's a, uh, who uh, he gave a definition of sovereignty as a <coughs> an authority with no with the highest political authority. There's nothing higher than that. Of course, he was talking in the context of the American. This is um, a report to I think it was in, <coughs> one of his letters to Congress mm -hmm. about the mm -hmm. time of just the beginning of the Civil War. He def what is sovereignty but the highest political authority? Well. If you're British, you're voting, you're only you're electing a member of the House of Commons, uh, the mother of Parliament. That used to be sovereign. You know, uh, the House of Commons was uh, was even was was sovereign. It, it, today, it has a there is a higher political authority. So a lot of people listening to this would say, well, this doesn't sound like a, a bad idea. Mm -hmm. This is humankind coming together to solve collective problems in a in a collective way. It's a a step forward. It certainly is superior to nation states fighting out uh, their disagreements um, in one way or another. Uh, what is wrong with it? If there right. Is? Uh, well, I guess normatively, I, I, I uh, when I did study uh, Fukuyama, I was interested in the liberal democratic nation state, uh, and I, um, <clears throat> I'm a supporter, let's say, of the liberal democratic nation state, democracy, and lim uh, limited government democracy, constitutional democracy. And I see global governance as it's developing as a challenge to that, uh, both uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, challenges that we just discussed, the foreign policy of democracy, so they can't, uh, Britain was one example, Israel is even a greater example where they're under tremendous pressure. So to, 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 to how to defend themselves, there, 
the democracy cannot determine its own rules and how to defend themselves, and even domestic policy. There's even interference in domestic policy. I'll give you an example. Um, I had a conversation with um, <coughs> our lady, Mrs. Patton, uh, who was, who, uh, she was a part of the UN uh, Monitoring Committee uh, for the UN Treaty, the Women's Treaty, it's called the CEDAW Treaty, the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Um, <coughs> Pamela uh, Patton was her name. And um, she was, when someone, uh, once, uh, once a nation uh, adheres to the treaty, joins the treaty, um, the treaty monitors come to see if you're, if you're following, you know, if you're uh, adhering to women's rights and so on. Um, <clears throat> so she was on the committee, the, the monitoring committee that went around in the different countries and all, most major countries in the world have signed this treaty. The United States, Iran, um, let's see who hasn't signed it, the United States, Iran, Sudan have not signed it. Saudi Arabia signed it, they don't necessarily pay attention to it, but they, they signed it. But so the op opposite, <laughs> well, so the United States stands with Iran and, and the Sudan. This is the kind of company that apparently you want to keep in the women's tree. Well, there's a reason, um, and part of it is, is about substantive domestic democracy. For example, the, uh, as I, I'm talking to this woman, uh, lady from the monitoring committee, from the UN monitoring committee, uh, she's from Mauritius. And I said, well, you guys went to Britain. That's a, this is Tony Blair's Britain at the time. That's a fairly progressive country, right? The women's rights should be fine there, but you find a lot of fault there. Uh, you found that uh, one of the big problems is um, in the British Parliament, you know, there's 500 members of Parliament and there's only 40 women, so it's 51% it women in the country. Why aren't there 51% uh, women in Parliament? The British said, well, we're, we're working on that. It's up to the parties to nominate. We have elections. Uh, she said, no, that's not uh, good enough. That's what we're interested in. We're not interested in equality of opportunity. This is actually in CEDAW, it's in the language uh, of the treaty, that our definition of equality is substantive equality. That's quality of, uh, <clears throat> of condition, quality of result. It's called parity now to a certain extent. So if women represent 50% uh, of the country, then 50% of the elected representatives should be women. So this is actually, this is of course, again, I'm a liberal in the traditional sense, the uh, uh, 19th century sense, so this is illiberal. This is post this is corporatism, where a person is, uh, <clears throat> and the political structure of this country is determined by membership in an ascribed group, a group you're born into, which was, of course, that's what actually what Mussolini did in the corporations, that's what Salazar and Franco had, with corporations, so your agriculture has so many seeds, well here men have so many seeds, women have certain seeds. And actually under communist regimes you did have these, these set aside. Well, today there's over a hundred countries have gender quotas. They're different. It's not always 50 percent. France, I believe, at this point has one third of uh, <coughs> local officials, mayors should be. Um, uh, the parties have to nominate women and so on. Well, um, this is substantive equality. Um, so it interferes in domestic policy. Now, the other the question brought up: Well, they don't have enforcement power, right? So there's no. Uh, so what's what's the problem? They're recommending these things, but um, they can't actually um, like send the black helicopters and, and force you to do something. Well, on the question of uh, the CEDAW Treaty, the American Bar Association is a big promoter of it, and they've developed, it's on their website, you can go right to it. Um, they developed a book, which is 200 pages. Uh, these are the questions that should be asked if the United States ratifies CEDAW. These are the issues to look at, and there's 200, um, 200 pages and probably hundreds of possible lawsuits because we signed the treaty, the treaty is the law of the land, uh, and then is it being implemented? Our, is uh, a state budget, and this is, this is all from the, the monitoring committee, and what percentage of your budget is spent on women's issues? Or on the children's treaty, what percentage of your budget is spent on children's treaties? This, Ireland was asked this on, um, on the children's treaty. Um, Various countries have been, have been told that um, you should spend a greater part of your budget on women's issues, but how are women's issues defined? It, it, it's usually defined by a particular, a particular view, political viewpoint. So this is um, interference then in domestic policy. It skews the domestic debate uh, because these are, a lot of these issues are issues of politics. I'll give you another example. Um, uh, Germany was under fire from the uh, the UN Monitoring Committee, but they said, well, you have this 
mandatory parental leave <coughs> by the federal German federal government. That's good. Again, that, that's of course a political issue whether a country wants to do that. But this was a human right. But we found out that um, men are not taking this leave. They're not, you know, whatever it is. That Ninety percent of the leave is being given to women. How can you equalize this? That may, you know, fifty percent of the men take the annual leave. The Germans said, well, this. We're doing some studies, so in other words, they have to spend money doing this sort of thing, working on trying to set up some program they, where they encourage men to take mental leave. So this is, this should be a matter of domestic policy, whether they want, first of all, whether they even want to have mandatory uh, leave of certain type, then whether the leave is, should be um, on the basis of substantive equality, sort of equal between men and so, women. So what these are political, these are issues, these are not issues of human rights. There are issues of domestic policy. Resource allocation. That the Democrat, well, the democratic, that's my core point. The democracies can decide for themselves. Um, again, this conversation with, with Mrs. Patton uh, from Mauritius was, uh, we talked about the Slovenian case. The uh, UN Monitoring Committee condemned Slovenia because only 30% of Slovenian children were in daycare. And with when they're in daycare, they can have various educational uh, opportunities. That's on the basis of CEDAW? On the basis of CEDAW, so the, the, it was the CEDAW monitoring committee. So the, I said, well, the, in Slovenia, what happened was that there was an election. The Christian Democrats won, and they their goal, their they wanted the slogan, "We're going to give subsidies to families so that people can stay home." That was their political policy. They won the election. The other party uh, favored the um, the national daycares. They lost. I said, wasn't this a democratic process? She said, no, it's not. A, this is a human right. These children are being deprived of the educational benefits that they would get in the, day, the daycare. The policy of the Christian Democrats in Slovenia was backward. They were trying to keep women at home with their subsidy policy. They were violating human rights. She said, I remember this case very well. It was in Slovenia. This is a violation of human rights. I said, well, this is one of the reasons the United States is having trouble ratifying this treaty is because this looks like interference in domestic politics. It's just, this looks like whether you're for it, again, I'm not talking about the substance of the issue you could be for. <clears throat> nationalized daycare, you could be for subsidies for stay-at-home, you could be for libertarian view, none of that. Uh, but these are, these are, this is about democratic politics, so that's my objection to uh, a good part of what's happening on the ground. Now, the ideals, that a lot of people can say the ideals are great, we're, we're we need some, we do need some international road. I'm an internationalist, so I favor serious international org uh, agreements that are uh, actually followed, but this is not an international agreement, this is um, transnational interference in domestic policy and a skewing of, of domestic so policy. You're, you're, you're and e even though there's no enforcement, as in the United States right. we do, you, we are litigious, so we can fire up higher lawsuits. So, so you're suggesting that what happens here is that a country uh, will sign uh, what looks like a kind of broad and vacuous commitment uh, and then discover that there were all kinds of details uh, in the minds of international enforcers who come forward in the various guises and try to bully uh, the state into accepting their prescriptions over the laws that the representative institutions of those states would otherwise enact. Right, and it's even actually in the treaty. It's a substantive equality actually is in the treaty, if you read the treaty. But yes, there's a political agenda, and they make an alliance with certain forces in a democracy against the other forces. In Slovenia, they're with the, out, the other party against the, the Christian Democratic Party. So there's a... Uh, but the ratifying states, you're, you're suggesting, they don't always see this coming. They think they're embracing some kind of wonderful, uh, broadly uh, yeah, you crafted could, ideal, right. and it turns well, out to be issue, much more I, than that. that exactly. Uh, why, what are you, against women's rights? What's mm -hmm. the matter? Mm -hmm. What's the matter with the United States? The United States is with Iran and Sudan. Is that, is that a respectable position? And if the United States ratified one of these treaties, and hence it was our, 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 our part of our part of our law, it would uh, open the the government, very governments at varying levels, to lawsuits based on non-compliance with what people would take to be the provisions of, of, of the treaty. That's what the American Bar Association mm -hmm. says. So I, I assume that they're probably right. I mean, it's up right on their website. You can look it up. Uh, ABA uh, CEDAW Treaty, and then there's this. 200 page book which is up on their website question after question uh, uh, all based on questions that the monitoring committees have asked in other countries and often uh, using the model of substantive equality which is which is this percentage which is this uh, uh, this parity percentile which is which is used in a lot of they use this uh, uh, 
uh, in a lot of countries. Uh, take a country like Norway, which is uh, Scandinavia and obviously very progressive on women's rights. The parliament of Norway is half women and so on. So the Boundary Committee said, you're doing very well on, in politics, you're doing well in all these areas, but you're not doing well on corporate boards. Only you know, 10% mm -hmm. of corporate, pri this is private corporate board, of private businesses on corporate boards, only 10% are women. So they just passed a law, they said, okay, we'll work on it. Uh, so they, they've raised it to, I think they have a law now, 40%, and they're working on that. So this does have some effect. In fact, was a, like I got this story from the New York Times. They were saying how the CEDAW affects nations, how it helps promote substantive equality. It did in Norway, it does, Germany is attempting to comply. So uh, it's not, this, this stuff is influential. The, uh, the activities of the, uh, the coalition, the Global Governance Coalition, and trans, I've used the term transnational progressive. There are many transnational pragmatists. There are transnational libertarians who would like to uh, promote uh, um, com a total global uh, trade and, and uh, exchange of services. So um, a lot of these ideas, of course, sound good. Free exchange of people, ideas, which were obviously for the free exchange of ideas. And uh, often opponents get painted into a corner. Well, what's um, you know, what's, what, you're against women's rights, you're against children. Right now, to, as we speak, today there's a hearing um, in Washington on the Disabled Treaty. So this is another UN treaty which has, could lead to some pitfalls, some lawsuits, if you get down to it. And uh, as there'll be testimony today by a bunch of law professors actually against the treaty and for the treaty. But again, are you in, uh, the issue will be raised, you're hostile to the disabled? There are people who are for the disabled and there are people who are against. So the political uh, position of the opponents uh, is often, it takes a while to explain what's actually going on. So that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, because I thought it was, it was worth explaining, because this, this is a series, we're serious about liberal democracy, then we should look at all aspects and are a good part of the, uh, the globalist, uh, gl global governance and transnationalism is a direct challenge to uh, both the domestic policy and the foreign policy of democratic states. And I, I believe that the liberal democratic state, in this sense, Fukuyama may be right. This is, looks like that's probably the best system we've come up with of how to govern ourselves. I mean, you could be, you have quite a smaller system. I suppose you could have a city state, uh, but some, or you could have a, a smaller type of, I mean, a uh, smaller, you know, Flanders could probably be a nation state, or, or, uh, but, um, a series of democratic nation states probably looks like the best way we can um, we can live in this world. It's, it's, that's at least my view, and, and uh, I think it, it holds up empirically pretty well. It's been uh, there, yeah. There have been uh, question on the wars, if I may, because this is often used to uh, <clears throat> say that the European Union is a good thing because it's prevented uh, Germany and France from going to war. It's because of the European Union. Um, after 1945, and, and that's and they self-congratulate themselves. The EU congratulates themselves. That it's, it's because of this that we're, we're peaceful. Uh, I think it has nothing to do with the European Union. I think the European Union did not exist. There would still be no war today uh, between Germany and France. Um, in 1990, there was no. Uh, I mean, there was a European Community. There, the European Union had not. They hadn't developed to the stage of the Euro and, and so on. But there would not have been a war between Mitterrand's France and. and Helmut Kohl's Germany. Um, why? Because they're both members of NATO, because they're both democracies, probably more than anything else, uh, because there was a significant U.S. forces in Europe, because uh, they were both members of NATO, because they had a lot in common. Um, so they, they, this was sort of traditional national state democracy. They weren't going to fight each other because they were democratic neighbors and because they were in a military alliance and because the United States would not have uh, permitted it or stood for it at that point. So all of these factors are much more uh, important than, than, the, than the existence of the European Union. There wasn't a war between the Weimar Germany and, and uh, the France of Poincaré in the, in the 20s, who was very hostile to, uh, he did occupy the Ruhr and so on in Germany, but he didn't, there wasn't a war. Um, uh, the Weimar Republic, a, a, a democracy, wasn't interested in going to war with France. It was when the dictatorship came in, when National Socialism took over in Germany, then there was a war. So democracy, you know, they can fight each other, depending on how you define democracy, but um, the chances are not great. And then you have this uh, uh, alliance of NATO. So I don't think the EU had, had nothing to do with preventing war. That's well, it, it, it sounds like um, uh, the transnationalism and, and global governance and, and all these various 
efforts to kind of uh, reduce the power of representative bodies at the nation state level are, at least to me, part and parcel of an even broader phenomenon that's taking place within many Western nation states, uh, in which power is sort of moving away from elected authorities like legislatures and into the hands of bureaucracies and courts. Um, which in turn would suggest that uh, transnationalism gains its traction in the Western world because of the allies it finds among folks who are already doing this on their own and are seeking a kind of new lever. If, if all that's true, um, one, I suppose, would wonder whether uh, transnationalism has the same kind of appeal outside the West as it does in. I mean, if you look at uh, what used to be called the Third World or the former communist states, are they very taken with this idea? Um, and I mean that more than just as a way to beat the West over the head. Um, is there a kind of internal constituency within those countries to be governed increasingly by transnational bodies? Or, this is, or is this peculiar to Europe and, and North America and the other uh, sort of Western style states? Well, what I know the most about probably is Eastern Europe, uh, having had uh, discussions with them. Uh, and, and people like President Klaus, of, uh, uh, who just left as president of the Czech Republic. Uh, <clears throat> and many countries in Central and Eastern Europe who had, of course, been under Soviet domination, and then were free, and then uh, they did, of course, very anxious to join the EU. They wanted to join the West. And they wanted to join NATO, they wanted to join the EU, they wanted to join the OECD, any kind of Western organization. Uh, once they were in the European Union, the European Union started giving them directions on what to do, then they started getting a little nervous. Some of these countries had said, wait a minute, we used to get directions from Moscow, now we're getting directions from Brussels. It's not the same thing, they're not sending in tanks, but uh, they are uh, restraining our, some of our, um, some of us. So some people in Eastern Europe, there is more of an interest in national sovereignty uh, in Eastern Europe. I think... Um, what about Russia? Uh, well, Russia, uh, I mean, there, there certainly is an interest in national sovereignty there. Uh, uh, they have, there's also a democracy problem. <laughs> right. Yes, you can obviously be sovereign and non democratic. But are they resistant to all this kind of international busybodyism uh, in places like that, in China? And, uh, yeah, I think they don't take it seriously. Uh -huh. I think they just uh, they do whatever they think is in their interest and they'll, they'll say anything um, if it's a way of <coughs> maybe irritating the United States. We see them um, pretending to be strongly in favor of human rights if it's a way of. Uh, criticizing the West. On the other hand, obviously, they don't follow it themselves. So I think so they Saudi Arabia ratifies CEDAW. Right, yeah. Right. So Saudi Arabia also sees everything through uh, the eyes of uh, power, power politics, traditional realpolitik, realistic. So that's all they see. I think they don't see this other stuff. It's Syria, if they see it, they see it as a Western weapon, which to an extent it was true. Human rights was a very effective uh, Western weapon during the Cold War. And, and a lot of these groups, like Amnesty and Human Rights, which started as um, following the Helsinki process, and then they gradually changed and became their main critics now of the United States and Israel, are there, and, and Britain and other, other Western powers. But originally they were critics of the Soviet Union. So this, yeah, the Soviets and the Saudis, and to an extent the Chinese, do not take this stuff seriously. And I, I'm not sure the third world, um, what used to be called the third world, the developing world now does either to that extent, or they, uh, they, they, they're pretty. They're, the UN is a pretty good base for them. I mean, they, 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 they control the UN, the non-aligned movement, a group of seventy-seven, and about hundred. They have a, they have the largest bloc, so they control the General Assembly. Um, so they use some of the Western rhetoric, but uh, their target is Israel, um, and, and Western. What well, they still worried about Western colonialism. There was the, the infamous Durban conference ten years ago, which was. Uh, Congress supposedly to promote racial equality that turned out to be basically an attack on, <coughs> on Israel and on, on, on the U.S. and on the mm -hmm. West on the grounds of racism and colonialism and so on. So those are their, um, so they're, they're playing a role. I mean, Fukuyama and that original argument was that the westernized elites in these countries will be accepting liberal democracy. I think what they're doing is using some of the terms and symbols and rhetoric of of the West, both democratic and, and globalist, uh, for their own uh, their own purposes. But there are um, there is a, a a social base and a core of uh, 
a, gl a global governance coalition that is seriously promoting this, both who believe it, who are ideological supporters of global governance and practical supporters. Are you a voice crying in the wilderness on these matters, or, or at least a member of a very small group? Uh, um, <laughs> and if so, what kind of hearing uh, are you beginning to get? Right. I think there's, a, there's an awareness now, uh, it wasn't so much in the 90s, but uh, that we've been, we have a label, we were labeled the New Sovereignist. Uh, Jack Goldsmith and Curtis Bradley wrote a book in 1997 a very long, on, the, on the, the new international law, which is transnational, how it differs from the mm -hmm. original idea of international law. Well, that set off a firestorm. Uh, Jeremy Rapkin has written books. So there's a group of uh, <coughs> sovereignists. There's a, um, in Washington, actually, there's a sovereignty caucus. There's now a sovereignty caucus on, uh, on, the, on Capitol Hill. 50 congressmen are a member of the Sovereignty Caucus. So there's a group of... Is that bipartisan? Or uh, unfortunately, no. Mm -hmm. Although everybody is in favor of sovereignty. Uh -huh. they, but they, uh, um, And there's a lot of opposition to some of the human rights treaties. This comes from concerns about sovereignty. So uh, the issue of sovereignty is, uh, at this point, unfortunately, too focused on... Um, uh, with, it should be a concern of all Americans uh, and, and not necessarily be a left-right issue. Uh, but there is an entry, there is, let's say, new sovereignists. Um, John Bolton is a controversial figure, but he was certainly part, he was labeled part of the new sovereignists, and he was, his role of the UN um, was, uh, and he wrote a book on this too, uh, explains a lot of these ideas, and, and, and it's very interesting because he talks about his relations with the other ambassadors. and So you can sort of see how transnational and international politics play out. I recommend his book, I think it's called Surrender is not an option, um, so it's one of the sovereignty books. So yes, we are. Uh, um, there's a scholarly group. Uh, there's an intellectual group. There's a there's a political group, uh, and I would say there's probably a lot of grassroots groups that are very concerned with sovereignty. Uh, that uh, maybe issue oriented on the disabled. There's a um, uh, parental rights group, and, and homeschoolers are worried about. Uh, global governance interfering in them. Uh, there's various, uh, and on the other side, there are groups, uh, also very activist groups, who are promoting uh, the women's treaty. They think this is why is the United States with Iran? Uh, this is a bio. The United States should be a, a leader of women's rights. And the United States should be a leader of disabled. We do have the strongest legislation. The ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, is the strongest legislation in the world. So our answer is, the United States is a world leader. Well, it is. We have the legislation, and you can follow the legislation. It's there so, for anybody to follow. When, when you, make you don't the, have to sign a treaty. When you, when you make the argument that the problem with all of this is that it's circumventing right. the democratic mm -hmm. process, um, there really aren't any accountable institutions at this transnational level um, that function in a manner that ordinary people, citizens of various countries, would have much of an impact on. What, what, what kind of response do you get from the proponents? Well, a couple different responses. Uh, one is, well, we have to, that's why we have to work this as... We have to work on this. We have to develop global democratic institutions. Some people even propose it. The philosopher Habermas, you know, has talked about um, how you would develop democratic global institutions. Uh, David Held has talked about a, a global parliament. Mm -hmm. So this would be with world democracy. There are a few bits, few people that advocate that. Other people worry, say, well, that's not too practical, but we can. Uh, the EU is working pretty good. So something like the EU. Um, other people, I'm going to talk about this in the lecture today, say, well, it's not really, democracy really is not the highest government by consent. The government, because a lot of times the majorities are are, uh, are not enlightened majorities. And, you know, even the founding fathers said this, and so you have to, so, uh, so real moral authority which should rest with epistemic communities. Uh, by which they Epistemic, mean? by mean, meaning, of course, epistemic, meaning knowledgeable communities who are people, maybe human rights experts, or ethicists, people who have actually studied these problems and are aware of questions of legitimacy. The wise and virtuous. Yeah, so they might be more virtuous. Mm -hmm. They might be have real legitimacy as opposed to mm -hmm. democratically elected legislatures where you have, uh, well, we know who's in Congress and who's in the House of Commons. So that's part of the answer. Um, um, <clears throat> but a good part of it is, well, we've got to keep working on this. Yeah, you raised some good points. On the other hand, we do, we do want world peace. We do, we do have, there is a problem of world hunger. Uh, problem of inequality, problem of women's rights, the disabled. Uh, how do we get to these? Uh, these people are well-meaning, they're working, and they're doing a lot of good work. Uh, um, the euro is a good thing, it's probably the, the uh, you know, the world, uh, 
some of these UN institutions are doing good work. We've got to continue this. We don't want to be isolated. You know, they, sometimes they, they paint us as, you know, well, you're, this is isolation, this is xenophobia. But once we get beyond that and we explain that we're internationalists, then they say, well, we still have to work toward this goal. So there's a type of utopianism involved, I suppose, there or and some of it is ameliorism. Or, uh, and, you know, if they can come up with um, better institutions, well, let's see them then. It hasn't happened for a couple hundred years. Is there something better than constitutional democracy? I don't see it on the horizon. Uh, I, have, I haven't seen it in theory. Uh, so those are some of the arguments we're involved with. Are you, are you optimistic that people are becoming more alert to the perils of uh, this type of governance? Uh, I think people are becoming more alert. I also think that the forces of global governance are not going away ever. I think this, this goes way back to the beginning. I mean, didn't. Uh, um, Aristotle and Alexander the Great, I think, argued. I mean, uh, Alexander uh, the Great was, was a student, of course, of Aristotle, was saying we need some type of world, and it was for peace. I mean, he conquered the world for peace, or to create a world. And Aristotle was still, I think, believing that the, the city-state, the, uh, the polis, was still a better system of government. So I think this is a perennial, and of course Kant uh, talked about uh, uh, he didn't talk about world government, but a federation of, of republics. And, Wordsworth's Parliament of yeah, Man. And Wordsworth's Parliament of Man. Dante talked about it. Well, so this, this idea will never go away. After World War II, there was all kinds of articles, uh, uh, all kinds of, uh, with the atomic bomb, well, surely now there will be world control of the atomic bomb. The United States was ready to do this. Um, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, there was someone like Dean Acheson, at, uh, who secretary said no, because even Truman was thinking about this, and he said no, this is probably not a good idea. I think we want to keep this. Well, if you'd like to read more about this, uh, there is an excellent <laughs> volume, like Sovereignty <laughs> or Submission. You might want to bring it down and hold it out to the is. camera there. there it's is. available on Amazon. Available on Amazon and uh, uh, at your local bookstore, you think, still? Uh, if there are local bookstores. If bookstore. there are local bookstores <laughs> nowadays, <laughs> okay. rather than transnational. <laughs> right. okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay, great. Good to be here. Thank you.